The relationship between German and Israelis, well, it's special because something about it is like we're based on a mutual trauma. It's most of the time very, very complex. Um, sometimes the trauma makes you love each other more. Sometimes it makes you um, be afraid of each other. The Holocaust has bound the fates of these two nations more closely than one could have imagined. The past is always there in the background, but that creates a very special bond. Sometimes horrific events bring people closer together than happy ones. I don't think the relationship can ever be normal, but that's okay, that may not be so bad. Things are definitely better than 70 years ago. No one's being gassed. That's an improvement. The song Eli, Eli, or A Walk to Caesarea, is known as a lament for the victims of the Holocaust. As a young girl in Israel, Rilly Willow often sang it in the children's choir at the Yad Vashem Memorial in Jerusalem. Today, Rilly is a professional singer, hoping to make it in Germany, performing her own songs. A poignant mission for the 34-year-old. My grandfather always wanted me to come and sing as, you know, a singer in Germany. And um, he heard that I'm going to Berlin and, like, his eyes were so happy about it. His older sister, Doa, she was an opera singer uh, here in Berlin. He was her little uh, brother and he really admired her. And when she was taken to Auschwitz, she sang there until she died. Like, she was forced to sing uh, to the officers. For him, it was actually kind of a victory, the fact that I come back and sing there. So it's very strong for him, you know, it just closes this circle for him. For him, I think it was like a, a triumph. Rilly has been commuting between Israel and Germany since 2013. She recently married a German and is now trying to find a foothold in both worlds. Tel Aviv, it's my home, and I'm in love with Tel Aviv completely. <laughs> I'm in love with the city. And here, I, I'm starting to feel better here. I'm starting to feel, I mean, I felt good as it is, but now I feel more like, um, I wouldn't say the same home, but yeah, second home. What first fascinated me about Israel were the people, their mentality, their receptiveness, directness, love of life. That's what grabbed me immediately. And I fell in love with the country, just like I did with the people. I felt really comfortable here right from the start, even though it's so different from Europe. The weather, the animals, the smells, the light, the architecture, the people. Everything is different, and I felt good right away. It felt like coming home. Ever since a high school exchange at an Israeli school, Tom Franz, who's German, felt drawn to Israel. After several more visits and completing a law degree in Germany, he emigrated to Israel in 2004. I gave up my life in Germany and came to Israel. I just took the plunge. I didn't have an invitation or any real job prospects. I didn't even have the right to stay here or work here. I just had the will and the belief that it was the right thing to do and that I would make it. In Israel, Tom converted to Judaism. He got married and pursued a hobby that had become a passion, cooking. In 2013, he won the popular TV cooking show Master Chef and became a celebrity in Israel overnight. 
It was fortunate that while I was doing the MasterChef show, people liked the Germanness that I represented instead of criticizing it. It's still like that. People know I come from Germany, but they're happy and proud that I've become one of them. I originally came here on a two-month scholarship, but after two weeks I knew I didn't want to leave. It's important to me that I fell in love with Israel first and then with an Israeli. I stayed here for love, but for love of the country, not the love of a man. German-born writer Zahra Stricker has been living in Israel for more than five years. She wrote her first novel, Five Kopecks, here. Now she's working on books about Israelis and Germans, the things they have in common and the problems they have with each other. At the beginning, probably like all Germans, I was a bit apprehensive, like when I talk on the phone with my mother in German, but I had very positive experiences. That said, I live in Tel Aviv, and young Tel Avivis are in fact really into Germany. Israelis are so wonderfully relaxed and laid back. I really like the mentality. There's a kind of easiness. You walk down the street, you sit down in a cafe, and immediately someone comes and starts chatting with you. That can be pretty annoying sometimes. The good thing about Israel is that you're practically never alone. The bad thing about Israel is that you're practically never alone. Germany may be 3,000 kilometers away, but Israelis always have it on their radar. The anti-Semitic voices in Germany, they're heard here too. Like during the recent conflict when videos with calls of gas the Jews circulated on the web. People here are aware of that. But to be honest, most Israelis are used to being hated in other parts of the world. That's nothing new. Most people here assume that they are hated everywhere else. They kind of grow up with that. I have a lot of friends who've been to Berlin many times, and they wonder if it might be the place for them. They're happy to spend a few months there. But when the question comes up about having a family and spending their lives there, they're not so sure. I came to Germany 12 years ago. My mother's boyfriend is German. He's from Hamburg, but he was working in Saxony-Anhalt. So I moved to a village there with my mother and my little brother. At first it was interesting to get to know a new culture. I didn't speak the language, so it was fine as long as I didn't understand what people were saying. Shahak Shapira was 15 when he moved to Germany, and it wasn't long before he learned the language and realized the words he heard were not always friendly. On the village soccer team, for instance, he was being insulted for being Jewish. But over the years, the graphic designer has developed a thick skin. Some idiots think that calling someone a Jew is an insult. For me, it was never an insult. If anything, it was a privilege. They'll have to try a little harder than that. The Jews have had to hear a lot over the course of history, and just calling us Jude, Jew, isn't going to hurt us. The place where it was mainly an issue was at soccer. I played on a team that was heavily influenced by Nazism, the current form. And that's where I heard most of these stupid remarks. At the beginning, it's a little like Stockholm Syndrome. You don't know what's abuse and what isn't, what hurts you and what doesn't. The more confidently you hold your own views, the more you know what's right and what's wrong. Shahak knew it was wrong when a group of young Muslims in the Berlin subway started shouting slogans against Jews and Israel. He filmed them with his mobile phone. A fight ensued. 
When the media picked up the story, Shahak surprised many people by defending Muslims in Germany. Everyone said they were surprised by my reaction, because I said I didn't want this being used as an instrument against Arabs or Muslims. But wouldn't everyone say that in my situation? My friends, the people I know, wouldn't react any differently. They wouldn't want to stir up hatred against another minority. If there's one thing that worries me, it's not explicitly about Jews. It's about the way it's becoming okay to stir up hatred in general. At the moment, more against Muslims. Shahak says he won't be intimidated by the rise in anti-Semitic attacks in Germany, some carried out by Muslims. And he rejects calls from Israeli politicians for Jews to leave Europe for Israel. There's a difference between healthy caution and scaremongering, quite apart from the question of whether Israel is safer than Germany or Europe. Besides, fear is the wrong response. Should we all hole up in Israel? No, I don't think so. We shouldn't hide. Shahak and an international group of friends meet up regularly in the Berlin district of Kreuzberg to cook for homeless people. We meet once a month and cook one vegetarian and one vegan three-course meal, six courses altogether. The idea is to bring together people from different social classes. Thank you. I like cooking with the people here. They come from all over the world. There are lots of Israelis, there are Tunisians, Americans, people from England, Australia, New Zealand, all over. The menu is also international. Today there's falafel, a Middle Eastern dish that's very popular in Israel. I might be the first person to take green beans from a can and make falafel out of them. A terrible idea, but I tried it out at home and it was pretty good. There are negative examples, but there are even more positive examples of people who make it worth staying here. My life is here, why should I give it up? In her apartment in Berlin, Rilly Willow shows us old photographs of her great aunt Dora. In 1943, the singer was deported from Berlin to Auschwitz. She was just 33 when she was murdered. This is from a show, and this is also from a concert that I know. This is from a show, for sure. From my grandfather, from all of the people that he talked like from his family, she was a great love of his life. She's a big sister, and he was always telling also how she was like very special and charismatic, and she and her fiancé. They lived together, and then they were both sent to Auschwitz. These pictures are all full of life and full of, you know, joy and art and creativity and, and charisma, you see here. And then you see that someone just smashed all this. In front of the house where Rilly's great aunt, Dora Wilimowska, last lived in Berlin, there's now one of the memorial paving stones known as Stolpersteine, or stumbling stones. This is a very special place for Rilly. When I see this, it really makes me cry, because it means a lot that there's like a little memory, like to know that the person was here, I think. Really, the Stolperstein, probably it means like it's the only tombstones. I think this is why the Stolperstein thing is so important, that you cannot overlook it. You can go to the museum, museum buy a ticket, you can, you can go like to see, you know, some touristic places. Uh, but then you have to, you know, to go and remember. And here it's like actually, yeah, I'm just 
stepping um, on the life of a person here, of um, a house, a family. It's weird that it's like a person that you didn't know, but you know, she meant so much to to my family and to my grandfather. Like he was talking about her so much. And of course, it means a lot that um, there is something. I think he would have been excited to know that um, there is this kind of... Uh, Think for her. In Tel Aviv, Tom Franz and his wife Dana are cooking for friends for the weekly Jewish Sabbath holiday. Tom dishes up quite a mixture of cultures. During my conversion, I spent a lot of time in a Moroccan synagogue, and I got to know many typical Moroccan Jewish dishes. One of them is called chaima. Probably 100% of Moroccan families make it every Friday. It's a very spicy tomato sauce in which fish is then poached. Although he finds his everyday life perfectly normal, the fact that Tom comes from the country responsible for the murder of six million Jews, the fact that his wife Dana is Jewish, and that they have children together, that is something special. My family is from a Holocaust survivor family. And our children, for instance, have, have um, both, both of, of, of our special connection in them. At first, when we met, I remember it was really difficult for me um, to just hear him on the phone talking to his friends and family in German. And it's something that I became very used to it, and I love the language, and I hear it all the time because my husband speaks to my children in German. But I know that, I mean, for a lot of Israelis, they have a sensitivity to, to the language because of, uh, of the past. I think since he won MasterChef, it's, uh, it, it made people uh, uh, easier to accept. Germans, uh, yeah. Germans. Um, Holocaust survivors even called Tom when the show was aired. And do you remember? And they said to him, now that I see you on the show, and, and I see how you are, and I see what you did to be part of the Jewish people, I feel sort of like a closed circle about the past. A lot of old people stop him in the street and they tell them, I'm a Holocaust survivor, I, I was in Auschwitz, I was in Bergen-Belsen, and, and when I see you, I think that Germany is different. When I see young Germans like you, I think it's a different country now. And it's, it's very special to us to know this. My personal way of life means more to them than all the diplomatic efforts made during the last 50 years. It's something formal for them. But what I dig is so personal that they can accept it. And it's like um, they accept it much more than everything that Germany gave from the political side. It's, it's something that comes from the heart and it reached the heart. And, and people really told me this and it's really exciting. My maternal grandfather was the only member of his family to survive the Holocaust. He grew up in the Warsaw Ghetto. When he was eight or nine, he buried his mother. She died of starvation. And his sister and his grandma were the only ones left. He had to take care of them. He smuggled food. But one day he came home and discovered all the Jews in the street had been deported to Treblinka. So there he was alone as a nine or ten-year-old, having to survive on his own. 
My other grandfather was part of the Olympic team at the 1972 Munich Games. He was one of the 11 Israeli athletes who were murdered there by a Palestinian terrorist organization. Amatsur Shapira was taken hostage by the Palestinian terrorists and died during a botched rescue attempt by German police. German-Israeli relations cast a shadow on Shahak's family history. But he has ways of coping. For a book he's writing, he pretends to be a reporter at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin and confronts visitors with a fake ban on selfies. Let's look for a few good candidates. There's a new ban on taking selfies here at the memorial. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think this is an. I guess it makes sense because it's a memorial, and it's meant to make you reflect and think about things. Yeah, I think it's come It all depends. But if it's about this particular place, I guess I can understand it. As you can hear, there are many laughs and many people that are making jokes in this place and trying, you know, like in Indian uh, uh, movies to try and do like this. And this is not funny from my perspective. This is something very hard from my perspective as an Israeli to walk in those very uh, small streets and get these hard feelings. This is definitely a very romantic place to kiss. I don't want to spoil the atmosphere. The atmosphere not I don't feel bad kissing in here. Uh, I think that that's not the right place to kiss, but I think that's not a bad thing to do. I see on Facebook that people use this as a profile picture when they're quasi standing on dead Jews or jumping around for fun. I don't know. I think people who have a little tact and who know something about the topic wouldn't do that. There's a change in generations. There are fewer and fewer people who remember. That's why it's important for us to have some reminders that are constant and always there, and hopefully will always remain there. Zara Stricker is in Jerusalem for the presentation of a collection of short stories, one of which she wrote. Israeli and German authors worked together on the book called We Don't Forget, We Go Dancing. There's this German phenomenon that Germans are so obsessed by dead Jews that they kind of forget that there are living ones too, and that the connection between Germans and Israelis goes much deeper than just the Holocaust. The stories are more about what concerns Germans and Israelis today. In a discussion with the publishers and some of the authors, the group talks about why they believe the relationship between Germans and Israelis is still characterized by cliches and unease. In Germany, other than Berlin, did Didn't not really that. travel in Israel? My first days in, in, in Israel were like I was running through the streets and I, I thought I had a big sign on my head which, uh, and, and pointing at me and saying, attention, German. And it took some time to come here to understand that it's... Maybe someone sees I'm German, but he would be fine with it. The longer I live here, the more I have the feeling that Germans are very scared of many things. That there's a little bit this feeling that you cannot get over anything. That you forget one night to kiss your kid goodnight and it has a lifelong trauma. But we're still kind of stuck in a loop because we will still have to always discuss this again and again. Like. The, it's always going to be like a gravity point in the relationship between somebody who's Israeli and somebody who's German who is, they're going to talk about their generation, they're going to talk about Holocaust. They, they can go dancing, but they can't forget, so. 
But I think in, in some aspect we have a very similar experience because we both grow up with the feeling that there's something very special, that we are marked somehow. And as much as Germans don't always want to be the murderers, the most evil people in the world, I guess Israelis also don't always want to be the victims. Both try to shake that off, but are constantly confronted from the other side with it. He was sent from Austria into emigration because the Nazis were coming chasing him. Rilly Willow and Benedict Bindewald married in the fall of 2014. A Jewish Israeli and a Christian German. A relationship that for a long time was hard to imagine. If my grandfather was alive, would he say something about it? Would it be difficult for him? And knowing my grandfather, the, who he was, he was I, I, absolutely 100% sure that he would never say, no, but he's German. And he would, he looked at the person and my parents always you know uh, educated us to look at the people of course you think yeah why well, it's going to be a problem not because of the german thing it was more about the religious uh, differences um, religion thing but that's also was not an issue and it for them it was not it maybe was for me just thinking would it be a problem but it never even came up as a problem never the only thing what my mother was worrying about is the picture of israel that you usually have in Germany, it's like what you get is usually that it's very dangerous to be there. That's also what I thought before I met Rilly. But that was, I think, the only issue. The, the whole religion thing for my mother was always individual. It's important for yourself. For me, religion has never had the meaning of something that divides, but something that connects. So I think that's why I've never been concerned that really is Jewish and I'm Christian. For me, it's always been something that enriches, not divides. And the fact that like, me and Benedict are family, now it's like we both uh, Israeli and um, German and Christian and Jewish. And we both decided to maintain our identities. And, you know, I will raise my kids with the knowledge of all the cultures and the religions. And so the, I think it's really up to us what's going to happen in the next generation. Since his conversion to Judaism, religion has been central to Tom Franz's life, alongside his family and his cooking. Tom prays three times a day, mostly with others. This synagogue is a small synagogue in a small, old quarter of Jerusalem, where my wife's great-grandfather lived, and he founded this synagogue. So it's kind of my family synagogue. It's the only one I have in the whole world. So I have a special connection to this place. When you live by religion, not just because everyone else does, but out of true conviction, it gives your life meaning. You know why you get up in the morning and go to work, why you've had children, why you have a relationship and where life is taking you, where you want to go. In the past, I didn't know what I was missing, but now I'm happy I have it. Tom is a frequent visitor at Jerusalem's popular Mehana Yehuda market. The vendors know him, 
and they treat the German like an old friend without reservations. I think Israelis are glad that relations with Germany have normalized, that they can travel there. For many, it's the land of their fathers and part of their history. I get the feeling that the bond between Germans and Jews was special back when it was still good. You still sense that today. It's a strong affinity that goes beyond the normal level. Every German who travels to Israel has to be aware of history. In some way, even if you're just a tourist, you're on a diplomatic mission. You can't just vacation in Israel like in Mallorca. You need to come here with a different attitude. And that's a good thing. I think you get a better sense of yourself, of what it means to be German in this context. And I think a lot of people have had positive experiences. One issue that Tom is constantly confronted with is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In the first years, I often believed I understood the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Even after 25 years, I have to say I still don't know enough to make up my mind completely. Most of the Germans I know who come here find that they have to back off a bit on political issues. Depending on what opinion you have and how you express it, it's not necessarily what Israelis want to hear, not from Germans anyway. Everyone should be able to criticize any country. The demarcation line is clear. If you criticize Israeli politics, the current political situation, that has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. That applies to every country. But when you deny the right of the country to exist, that is anti-Semitic. It's also senseless. No one's about to leave, neither the Palestinians nor the Israelis. I often hear people say they'd like German politicians to play a more active role and be more critical of Israel. But I'm not sure if that is so honest. I think when things like that are said by Germans, it comes across very different. To be quite honest, I don't want to get into that and I don't want to find out, you know, that someone is really now about to get into a political discussion with me. I, you know, it's also kind of like when I'm in Berlin, I, I really want to not be in it. But it's hard not to be in it in a city like Berlin, with so many people from Muslim countries living here. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Soon after the 2014 Israel-Gaza conflict, Rilly met a young woman from a Palestinian family in her neighborhood bakery. I told them that first time that I met you, I cried. You remember? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It was sad. Yes, it was very I remember, I every day remember this. We spoke yes. about uh, Palestine, Palestine and, and Tel Israel, yeah. Tel Aviv, and alles. And I felt terrible. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and then, terrible. yeah, and then she told me Palestine, so I just started to cry because I was so emotional and floated. Yes. And, and I'm so sorry, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. I cry, she cry, the people come. Yeah. <laughs> In Israel, we don't see each other much, and now we come. I come here to Berlin, and then she's here, and I'm here, and we can talk freely, like it's like on a safe land that nobody's fighting. Human dignity shall be inviolable, right? So I don't care where they're from. People should be kind and humane. That's what counts. <laughs> I wish I, I could have also friends in Israel. That's like I could meet them. Um, on a regular basis, you know. I come here, I see her, I have the coffee, and <laughs> it's great. But it happens in another country, <laughs> and I hope it could happen maybe in Israel, and that she can visit in Israel, maybe. You married? Yeah, yeah. Now, and after I saw you. Rilly's wish probably won't come to pass anytime soon, but one of Zara Stricke's dreams has come true. The short story she contributed to the collection published in a book 
has come out in Hebrew translation. I'm very, very proud that something I wrote is finally available in Hebrew. This is the first thing that has actually been translated into Hebrew, so now my friends and family can read my work. It's great, but it's also a little frightening. When you're far from home, you're more alert. You wake up in the morning wondering what might happen. Unfamiliar places always make you feel a bit more alive. <laughs> that realization is something that Zara Stricker wants to apply to her work as a writer. She intends to stay true to Israel. Her Israeli friends make the decision easier for her. None of them take the German past lightly, but they face the future with optimism, together. In Israel, the Holocaust has a, a it's very important component of, of the of our uh, being here. Uh, again, whether we'd like it or not. So I believe that when I meet, meet a German guy, uh, it will be there even if I don't want it to be. So let's talk about it five minutes and move on. My grandfather and grandmother are both Holocaust survivors. They will say that their foot will never uh, touch the German again, but uh, I mean Germany. Um, but for me, it's like everything. Any other European country that I would like to visit again? Yeah. No, no, no. Also, wenn ich mir was für die Zukunft wünschen dürfte. I really hope that in the future Germans will be even half as interested in Israel as Israelis are in Germany. I mean really interested, asking questions, coming here to see things. To develop a relationship with someone you need to get to know them. And that won't happen if you think you already know everything and need to teach them things. You have to be open to learning yourself. Shahak is also open for new things, like a stage production mocking racist Jewish stereotypes. What's the best way to deal with clichés about Jews? For Shahak and the play's director, Noam Brusolovsky, the answer is with humor. It can be pretty amusing when people don't know that you're Jewish and then you make some Jewish joke. Then you get to see how the people react. It's a really good test. You have an advantage because you don't have an accent. As an Israeli, I have the same problem that every foreigner has here, problems that have to do with language and cultural acceptance, and especially as an Israeli. I went through all that a long time ago. I learned the language, I've heard all the insults. Hey, learn German. No, I think instead we should try to turn the Germans into Jews. Absolutely. <laughs> the Judaization of the West, so to speak. We'll inject hummus straight into their bloodstream when they're not looking. That'll get them hooked. From a historical point of view, I find it really exciting that so many Israelis are here, given the history of Germans and Jews. I think we bring a lot to the table. After everything we've seen here today, there's no question. Yeah. 
Tom Franz is convinced that Israelis and Germans can harmonize on a personal level. Opposites enrich each other when they come together in the right way and don't clash. We can learn a lot from each other. The Germans from the Israelis and the Israelis from the Germans. But we have to get to know each other better. My wish for both our people is for us to be more interested in each other, not just at the level of politics or history. We should leave those levels behind us in our personal associations. Then we'll have a great shared future. For Rilly Willow, music symbolizes how well Israelis and Germans can harmonize. Together with her husband, Benedict, and German friends, she's rehearsing some of her songs. <laughs> I think it really um, goes well with my style because I'm like coming from a very classical background. But now when I write my songs, the fact that Benedict took them and like arranged it in a way that will be uh, that will fit everybody here, and that they're really into that, so it's really fun to to play with them. We should celebrate every time that humans are going through some pain together and that they can have a good relationship with each other. And I think it's really beautiful that people live here and they have relationships and they have life here and they work together and they love each other after all. I think it's something that we really should celebrate for the moment. Thank you. 